Well, my name's uh, Scott Gould. I'm the Deputy Secretary of uh, Veterans Affairs, and you'll soon find that all the deputies basically serve as the Chief Operating Officer, so we are delighted to have uh, a room full of CEOs with us today. Uh, for uh, the folks on the uh, web team, and just to be able to uh, say hello to each other now, I'd like to go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves briefly. And I'll start with Susan Tynan on my right. Hi, I'm Susan Tynan, and I work for the Chief Performance Officer of Deaf Science, and I'm thrilled to have everyone here today. Thank you. I'm Peter Darby. I'm CEO of PG&E Corporation. And I'm Ron Sargent, the CEO of Stables. I'm Sam Gillow, I'm CEO of Sabre. John Procari, Deputy Secretary, Department of Transportation. Bill McComb, CEO, Liz Claiborne. Dan Poneman, I almost said COO. <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Secretary of Energy. Greg Page, CEO at Cargill. Jeff Fettig, CEO of Whirlpool. Sam Allen, CEO at Deere & Company. Chris Lewis, with White House Cabinet Affairs. Mike Thompson, CEO of Fair Oaks. Harold Mills, CEO of Zero Chaos. And we've got a lot of talent around the, uh, the back wall here, CIOs and CTOs from the government. I'm going to depart from the script and ask uh, Roger Baker would introduce himself and then uh, go around so that everybody says hello. I'm Roger Baker, I'm a CIO of Veterans Affairs, and I work for Secretary Gould. I'm CIO of the Energy Delighted to have you here today. Uh, just a, a little bit of background for myself, formerly an executive uh, IBM, been a CFO in the Department of Commerce in the 90s. Wanted to make a couple of quick observations about the difference between the private sector and the public sector that we're serving. And three uh, things come to mind for me. Uh, one is something that is natural to you if swimming is a fish in the water, uh, and that's the structure of property rights and residual claims uh, in corporations. We just don't have that wonderful thing called uh, a stock option uh, for stock. It affects how we think about ownership, and it affects how and what tools we have available uh, in terms of incentives. Uh, secondly, we have a highly distributed uh, decision-making process. Can you imagine having a board of directors with 535 folks? Uh, I'm referring, of course, to Congress uh, and the Senate, all of whom feel fully empowered uh, to be able to tell you what to do and when and, and, uh, and how much. Add to that, uh, in addition to Capitol Hill, uh, the courts, uh, and the public, uh, you have quite a rich set of constraints in the decision-making process. And finally, this concept of a compelled customer. We don't get to choose it. And you don't get to choose where, and you can't decide, look, it's too expensive to be able to serve a customer in this particular area. I'm going to choose to leave those folks out. Uh, quite the contrary, everyone's in. And unfortunately, sometimes for the public, uh, you're their only option for, for getting that service. So despite those similarities, which I wanted to set aside, my firm belief is that there are a great many similarities. And so the lessons that you are bringing uh, to us here today, that you prepared in your uh, homework, if I can use that term, and from your own experience, are directly relevant uh, to what we have uh, to talk about today. So I'm especially excited uh, to have uh, business leaders here with expertise on large-scale transformation. At the Department of Veterans Affairs, we're in the midst of a large-scale uh, transformation we're working on as the President mentioned uh, a moment ago, a broad range of issues, including eliminating the backlog uh, at the VA for collecting our benefits and providing uh, disability pensions uh, for our veterans. Uh, my co-moderator is uh, Susan uh, Tynan. Uh, Susan works for Jeff Science. He's the nation's first chief performance officer. So this is a new area of emphasis uh, by the President uh, to make sure that we're thinking uh, in new ways about how we run government. Susan comes from the private sector, great background. She's been on the investment side, uh, technology side, consulting. Um, so I will turn to her uh, often. Um, we'd like to take a couple of minutes to cover uh, logistics. Uh, then Susan will give us a summary of the results of the ranking exercise that you completed. And from there, we'll jump into the discussion of uh, key lessons. I have asked uh, Jeff Fetty uh, before the session. Jeff, thank you. Uh, if he would be willing to report back at the top level uh, about our lessons from this breakout session to the larger group at the end of the day. Jeff will spend maybe 10 minutes together afterwards, kind of uh, collate all of the key points here 
uh, and uh, appreciate you very much stepping up into that role. Our goal today is to surface the best private sector ideas for managing large-scale uh, business transformation and IT system development projects. We've got ambitious goals uh, in this area, and we hope that today will be the beginning of a relationship where you can bring your talent and expertise to the table as we work to drive change in government. Uh, we know, as we mentioned earlier, government's got a lot of unique challenges, uh, but we believe that there are clear lessons here that uh, apply to the public sector. Today is classic brainstorming. Uh, you're going to do it in a way uh, that you probably have never done before, and that's live streaming <laughs> on the web as we do it. And I actually think it's a great example of not only one of the differences about how we manage and how we lead in government, but it's uh, actually an example of our commitment to transparency in government. So we're really making that effort to make sure that uh, what you have to contribute and what we learn from that and exchange together uh, is an example of how we ought to be uh, working in government. Uh, we appreciate your energetic response to the homework. Uh, overwhelmed uh, was the uh, report from the team about the quality, uh, the ideas that you raised in your pre-work. Uh, don't feel an obligation to cover everything. We're going we're to take all of that goodness and over the course of 30 days uh, generate a, a report uh, that will include all of that and very thoughtful uh, integration and synthesis of what uh, you have told us in writing. But we would like to get the advantage of the catch ball, the, the, uh, the creativity around the table, and I'd love to see you uh, uh, follow a duty to dissent, uh, which I think uh, the best companies in the world do, and that is if you have a disagreement, say just a minute there uh, and uh, challenge someone, because we'll get more out of that, we'll see that uh, interaction uh, occur. So we'll make sure everyone in the room gets a copy of that report uh, when it's released. Uh, Jeff Science, our Chief Performance Officer, is going to tell us more about the follow-up efforts of how we keep this dialogue going over time. Uh, very much our aspiration here is not to do a once and done. Uh, we want to engage in a relationship and a conversation over time uh, if you have the, uh, the resources and the interest in doing that. i got a room full of CEOs. I'm sure I don't need to say this, but your active response, I will uh, do my best uh, to prod and bring people out if you, if you sort of uh, get overwhelmed by all this. Um, we'll come after you. I know uh, that uh, you're going to have good ideas uh, to give us. In your responses, if you would, please think about concrete lessons, activities, and behaviors that we could then take and kind of apply in this environment. So we're really looking for that a pragmatic edge uh, to what we're doing based on your experience. All right, so uh, let's jump in. I'm going to start by asking uh, Susan Tynan. Uh, to briefly summarize the results of the ranking exercise that you did. And for those folks who are uh, listening in on the web streaming for the first time, I'll just let them know that each one of the participants they see around this table has spent some time thinking about this before uh, they came in, and that's why we have something to summarize. Great. Thank you. Uh, we did ask all the CEOs participating to do some advanced work. In one of those exercises, you'll see the results on that board. It was a ranking exercise saying, what are the key factors to ensuring success in a large scale business transformation effort? And I'll, I'll read you the top ones because I know it's, it's hard to see back there. We weighted uh, the scores based on your ranks and a clear winner emerged. And it's that there, ha there must be an organizational mandate for change. So I don't know that there's a big surprise there. Um, second was identifying the right processes to engineer. And a close third was that there has to be continued engagement and accountability by the line managers. And so certainly in your anecdotes, we, we heard it too. And so these are hopefully a good frame for us to begin our discussions, but we're hopeful you'll let us know more about the how. We know these are broad general factors that everyone should consider, but, but how do successful businesses ensure they're done right? Great, so I'll uh, start off with this organizational mandate for change as a way to kind of guide and cluster some of our uh, conversation and perhaps uh, ask uh, Indra uh, from PepsiCo to share some of her thoughts about how you did this, so what some of the tools are uh, that you used to make this happen. Um, how'd you make sure that you know when you did it, you actually had done it right? Well, we're in the middle of it, so I don't know if you've done it right. It's just that our process so far and our progress so far has been without any hiccups, so we feel good about it. Um, I think after when we first started articulating the need for change, it was very important that there was one loud voice, uh, and the voice had clout that was articulating the need to change. You know, I was president of the company at that time, and I just lay on the tracks and said we had to make these changes happen. And if, you, if I had articulated those changes based on back office improvements, it wouldn't have gotten anywhere. But when you articulate it in the context of serving the customer better, 
um, really making a difference to our top line growth, all of a sudden everybody got a little. Uh, you know, the back end had to be there to serve the customer better, but it had to be stated in, uh, in terms of serving the customer better. Once you had that, once you uh, articulated a very powerful case, and you've got to start off recognizing that most people won't get it, because people don't like to talk about IT, people think of it as a necessary evil. Once you articulated the case right, you've got to lay out a very compelling vision of what the future could look like. And that was perhaps the most difficult thing to do because uh, if you get carried away and articulate something that's so up in the ether, people just go, I can't relate to it. So you have to lay out a vision that was compelling enough, but quite near terms. So people can say, I, I think I can get there. So laying that out is very important, and then taking it on the road, communicating it again and again and again, and getting buy-in from everybody. Ultimately, it became their project as opposed to my project. And then after that, you've got to appropriate the money and get going. And that upfront piece is critically important. And was there a, uh, a set of tools on the Stratcom strategic communications that you used to, uh, to get out on the road and uh, convey your message powerfully? Oh, absolutely. We had to call the project some catchy name. You know, It was really for us to do Project Catch Up, but we call it Project One Up because nobody likes to be part of Project Catch Up. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, we said we're going to one up the competition with this. And so uh, we took it on the road, prepared all the communications materials, a lot of incentives for people, yes. we did some fast starts. And, uh, you know, celebrate the people who agreed to get on this project, guaranteed them uh, careers, celebrated them, gave them additional incentives, so in addition to bonuses, they got performance bonuses on top of their regular bonuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, at every point in time, because they were all in a separate program management office, they were afraid they'd get forgotten. Uh, so we tried to schedule board meetings in that, in that, in that location. Um, you know, we made sure the CEO came there as often as he could. And even after I became CEO, I make it a point to visit that location twice or thrice a year, give out you know, chairman's awards to them or some sort of an award to them. Uh, only in the White House could you go from PepsiCo to Liz Claiborne, but uh, Bill, uh, you know, are you, uh, do you resonate with some of those uh, ideas or concepts or challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Of I mean, uh, you know, the, the only uh, dimension that I would add to what Indra is saying is what, when you hear her talk, what she's saying, and I'm not so sure these words on this form captured it, mm -hmm. it's about creating a vision. And, you know, people, people aspire to follow. They look for leaders and they look for leadership. And what they want is they want a vision. So the mandate for change needs to be in, in language and in concepts that people aspire to the outcome. So that when you hear President Obama speak about the Department of Veterans Affairs and that particular project, it's a, it, 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 the goal, the fundamental and simple goal laid out ladders up to a vision that is big and powerful and something that nobody could argue with. And so I think that the goal in, in our big corporations, but in, in governmental departments as well, is to, is to make sure that, that the mandate for change is not languaged in terms of processes or technology terms, but outcome-oriented vision statements that you could stand up and say, I want to be a part of making this thing better. So, so always putting things, I mean, we have a goal, and, and I'm sure it's the same at PepsiCo, of putting everything in an end, cons an end customer framework. And I don't mean maybe the person that's going to drink the beverage or, you know, try on the dress, but, but stakeholders in the value chain of the business. And, um, and, and, and to, to, to put it in a, I want to call it a, a no-nonsense framework, where it doesn't sound like a great big god-awful corporate vision, but something that, that, that a Harry Truman would have put his arms around, you know? So uh, that, that, that I just wanted to add that to that, that mandate for change is, is tantamount to an aspiration and a vision. Now, Bill, I remember from your homework, you said the vision had to be big enough that it created discomfort. Yeah, cognitive dissonance. I, I really believe that. I, I believe that that if it, when you talk about a mandate for change, if all the heads nod really easily, you probably haven't pressed hard enough. And that the, that the great, great, great work comes when, when it, you actually press a button that creates some cognitive dissonance. And where people say, that's an impossible stretch, or there's no way we could get there. So in your particular case, it might be taking a backlog that, that let's just say your backlog is three months for a processing of a claim. 
a, a, a really audacious goal might be two hours. And, and people could say, there's no way, there's no possibility in it. Mm -hmm. But actually, when you push the envelope very, very, very hard like that, that's when you get actually into causing a mindset of, of what actually a mandate is. So, so stretching it and, and pushing it is, I think it's really key. The problem with a lot of these projects and a lot of this work is that organizations and people, when you start getting into groups and teams, they start neutralizing the, 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 the ambition. Not intentionally, but it just starts happening. And the next thing you know, you go from being a transformational project to an incremental project. And it's one of the reasons why it's hard to believe the stories the president told downstairs yes. about some of those facts at the patent office, for example, yes. or even the situation at Veterans Affairs. Yes. And you stop and say, the reason it gets that way yes. is that it's one thing to create a mandate for change, but it's another thing to really pull people to the big outcome. But just picking up from that we left off, um, initially the resistance in the organization is huge because nobody wants to do it because it's taking away from your PL and they'd rather spend that on something else. This is where Sarbanes Oxley helped because we showed the as is architecture of every application, every legacy, and told all the CFOs or the division CFOs, do you know the certified financials based on this architecture? That terrified them. They wanted it cleaned up real fast right. because. I mean, this maze, I mean, don't know where the data is flowing, don't know where the, what the apps are telling you. But crises, crises are interesting. When I think back, just a few weeks ago, as we were ringing in the new year, I was, I was, I could hardly believe the 10 years that passed since mm -hmm. Y2K. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about the amount of sheer energy, resource, commitment that went in because it, it was, the outcome was considered by many of us to be binary. And it, what we accomplished from a technology perspective was amazing. The sad thing was that it wasn't moving the ball forward in any significant way on big fundamental change against customer metrics. So I, I think that, that to the extent that when, when there is a big gap between the desired outcome and the present state, as, as was languished by the president in the opening remarks, I think you need a Project Manhattan type mentality to stop and say, we're gonna do it and we're gonna go all the way. And that's why I say that, that very tightly wound into that first point about organization mandate is setting a big enough goal that, that all the energy and talent that goes into it and all the things that I'm sure we'll talk about in terms of executing, take you to the right bold destination and not one halfway there. Is that powerful statement a statement that applies equally well to those of you who have been and grown up in companies? Uh, going through the resumes, I saw people who had spent 20, 30 years in a single firm, know their organization well. And others of you entrepreneurs who had basically come into your organizations uh, later on in your career and later on in the process. So uh, please, Ryan, yeah. what, how do you compare that challenge? Uh, I believe and I agree with the, what's been said. I mean, vision is certainly important, but it's vision is big. It's a little hard to define. I understand it's driven from the top, but the person at the top isn't going to execute this thing. And to me, I think having a vision is fine, but more importantly, and that wasn't my number one. My number one was having a clear objective and definition of, definition of success. And to me, that's more important, uh, kind of knowing how you're going to define this thing. And I think a lot of times, when we get too big picture, we don't get stuff done. And I like IT projects that you can kind of bite off in pieces. You know, we show some success, we declare victory, we move on to the next IT project and declare success. So I just think it's important we have a vision, but I think it's probably more important to have kind of objectives of what is successful. If I could merge the, uh, the two concepts together because I think they're both very valid. Uh, at our company, we went through the energy crisis, we went through a bankruptcy, the state was at war with us, we had to seek protection from the federal government to save us from the state. Uh, and what, uh, what happened, came, came out of that was we were not viewed at all favorably. And so in my first uh, quarter as CEO, I got the top people together to create a vision and say, we will be the leading, we will be the best utility in the United States. At that time, people might have argued we were the worst. And then we actually, in picking up on getting something sort of very, very large, we have combined that with the challenge of climate change. 
and that climate change is the biggest challenge that mankind has ever faced, and we've come to that conclusion based on data and documentation, and that our job is not just the reliable and safe provision of electric and gas, but it is to do it in a sustainable fashion and then find a way to lead the industry to the same conclusion and to transform the industry so we actually make more money by selling less power today in our company and we're trying to get that paradigm shifted across the country. But I think the point that Ron raised was so important that you have that big target up there and despite the fact that people would come to me and say, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, it means our nuclear station will be the best nuclear station uh, in the country and we will establish the benchmarks for that. Our IT organization will be the leading IT organization, not only identified by us, but by others. They'll be saying, you got it at PG&E. But it's really important to go the whole gamut. So to, to have the vision, but then go to the, the goals. So we came up with, how will we know when we're there? And so what we came up with, our customers will be satisfied. So we came up to the first decile in customer satisfaction is our goal. Our employees will be energized, so we want them to be in the first decile. Our shareholders there, because it's more volatile with TSR, we said the first quartile in terms of our comparator group. Uh, and then environmental leadership that both inside and outside people would say uh, were there. So I think it's very important to have the bold vision, but then you have to break that into objectives down the way. And then most importantly, while it starts with what I describe as a white hot commitment from the CEO, it becomes a revolution among the people at the bottom, almost difficult to control at times, where they pick it up and own it. And that's so important for government because in government, the, the people who are full-time employees say, you know, you policymakers at the top, you come and go, <coughs> but we only want to do something that, and commit to something that will follow through. So if you engage them, it becomes their project, and they'll follow it through even though you may come and go over time. So let me add a third dimension then maybe, and I'm sure both of you all have this in your organizations. You're trying to, you know, put it all together, but uh, for me, the third dimension is culture. And as I think about these changes, for one, they're out of necessity. Uh, but, you know, we're a smaller company. We probably uh, would represent the lower end of, of some of the, the big companies in the, in the world here, in the, in the room. But uh, what we do, we do out of necessity to be competitive, to be service oriented. And to me, instead of creating vision statements, I try to create culture statements. And if I can get the people in my company to learn, agree, uh, adjust to the culture that I want to create, that then becomes our transformation. Can you give an example? Uh, one would be uh, pretty much uh, everything we do on the, on the service side. Uh, we supply uh, both food service and retail customers. And um, one of the, the cultures in my company is to have the, the very best outstanding uh, service necessary. That is just what I try to do by example. And that culture uh, we've been working on for five years and it is now very deeply seated in our company so that now any employee knows exactly what to do to service the customer and to get feedback from that customer that the, that the service is outstanding. Is that uh, cultural component the same as the white hot commitment that you mentioned a moment ago, Peter, or is it a contributor to it? Well, I, I just wanted to say that I agree with the point entirely about the culture and the values. So what we did was we first came up with that vision of leading utility um, and then we said, what are the values and behaviors that will be required in order for us to get there? Mm -hmm. So for example, we had a tendency where everybody was diplomatic and didn't engage and didn't disagree. We said, that's not gonna create change at all. We have to engage, we gotta, everybody has to get to the table, they talk about what they agree on and don't agree on, and then when they leave the table, they have to go with a consensus rather than not talk at the table, step away from the table and say, those guys are crazy, we're not doing this at all. <laughs> so, so we looked at the values and came up with things like integrity, direct communication, uh, teamwork, which is so important, commitment to the environment, commitment to our communities. So the, the discussion of the values was integral 
to that discussion, and I'm sorry I missed that in the, in the point, but do you, do you know that almost uh, at many of our meetings, we start the meeting with a discussion of values and mm -hmm. say one person's going to talk about the values, one of the values, and then talk about how it relates to the particular business problem we're in. Because you will only get a focus on values if you're discussing it at each meeting. It can't be something up on the wall that the chairman and a couple of guys figured out and then they left it there. And people have to live it and we discuss them all the time. Scott, I, I think it's a bit uh, clarification. Are we talking about improving the functioning of any one department or are we talking about streamlining government? Two very different issues because if we're talking about making the patent department more efficient, then I agree with you, Ron. I think every six months you have a project implemented and carry on. But if you're talking about streamlining government, which is department needs to talk to each other, you want to have one procurement process that's highly efficient, you're talking about a completely new architecture for how government should work. If that's the case, I don't even know how you can start without a yeah, complete right. uh, architecture of how you want government to work and then translate it to bite-sized projects, but without an overarching vision. I mean, we are a $43 billion company. It took us a year to develop the vision and get it right and take it on the road and get people to buy it. For the size of government, I don't know how you can do it without it. So I, you, know, you just have to start off and say, are you automating a department and function or are you streamlining government? I think the distance between the two is miles. And, and, I, and I think we're going to see a dialogue play out where the problem here is T-shaped. It's both. Yeah. It's both a desire to profoundly affect the way government is run and also to achieve it by deep vertical strokes in each of our agencies, which are themselves, in the case of the VA, you know, a Fortune 15 company. Dan, yeah. your comments well, on uh, there's energy. A, yeah, there's a third uh, dimension to this. And it's interesting because when it comes to vision, as you were saying, Peter, we got vision in terms of the climate change mandate. We have a vision from the president of no nuclear weapons uh, in, in, in that kind of future. And do we have a Manhattan Project? Actually, we were the Manhattan Project. We literally had a Manhattan Project, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was us. Right? And we have not only a vision, we have a visionary. It's Peter Orzag, well known Steve Chu, to articulate it. So we have some of those building blocks. Here's the challenge. We have those, and not only that, but virtue of our 535 uh, uh, members of our board of directors and, and, and Peter Orzek at the OMB, we are entrusted with $38.7 billion of funds to invest in Clean Energy and the Recovery Act, in addition to the things we're already doing. We have to be smart about how we take those investments and leverage them in a way that the market will pick it up. Because we're not producing energy for the United States government. We are trying to make those portfolio investments, whether it's in our advanced technology automobile program, biomass, smart grid, that will only work if they propagate through the marketplace. So for us to figure out, we, we do need that streamlined vision, but we have to have a vision that resonates in the marketplace. And I would learn a lot, I think, from hearing from our CEO colleagues, how to, how to do that, because we know about the very first part, things that no shareholder should be expected to wait you know, 29 quarters for a return, right? So we know that's a place we can add that. We know that if Wall Street will just finance the technology anyway, we're no longer needed. So there are, there are at least a couple of valleys of depth between those points. For us to figure out how to leverage those federal dollars wisely in those troughs it would be very helpful. You know where we found um, it, it's in an area that government least likes to focus. And we've looked at it in the state of California with the bringing renewables to market. We've looked at it with the Department of Energy and providing loan guarantees uh, for renewable producers and for nuclear. And the problem is that trying to get something done with government is the most difficult of all processes. And so to the extent that you can view your processes like a production line, an end-to-end -end production line, and say, okay, a person files an application for renewable or for a loan guarantee, when, it, when you know, does that product come out the end, the approvals, all of the necessary approvals, and how does that compare with what is reasonable? What we're seeing in California between the federal government, the state government, and the local government, it can be nine years or more to bring a renewable project, clean energy, to, to market. 
with the loan guarantees, I think, you know, in a discussion this morning that we had uh, over at DOE, the, the loan guarantees and approvals aren't coming out. And so what you need to do is say, is that a critical part of what government is doing? The answer is yes. How are we doing in that? Not well. Okay, we're going to develop a production line end-to-end -end approach to this. We're going to figure out where the roadblocks are. We're going to assign accountabilities, and we're going to get this production line running because it's not now. It's not running in the federal government. It's not running in the state of California. The state of California is raising the bar and saying you have to do 33% EPS, but the gauntlet of collectivity of these different departments makes it impossible to comply with the law. Yeah. It, that's, I think that's where I would also try to add a dimension because as, as I ranked them, you know, there was this whole engagement of line, line managers and, and as an entrepreneur, you know, the other sort of oxymoron in this is, uh, is the concept of speed. Um, and so while it is important and critical to have an overarching vision, every, every line manager has to understand how they fit into that. So whether it's you, uh, you trying to get a, a, a nuclear site approved or whether it's someone trying to get a passport approved, they have to understand how it fits into the overarching vision of better government. And, 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 and you have to have the audacious goals that lead to, you know, sort of faster cycle times and speed. And that takes you back, in my opinion, to Ron's opinion, or Ron's statement of saying, you have to break it up. You, you, you almost have to have the overarching scenario, but every group, every team also has to have how their actions will fit into that overarching vision so that you can get something actually done. Because you can spend a lot of time talking about vision. You can spend a lot of time uh, uh, campaigning or, or for promoting vision around the company. But if things aren't actually getting done, if cycle times aren't decreasing by 40%, or, or if, if it doesn't take one year versus nine, but remember the, remember the task, right? It was a grid full of things that you would like to all prioritize, one, two, three, or one, 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 yeah. one, one. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it wasn't an either or here. I, yes. You know, I, 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 to steer the conversation maybe a little bit differently, I, I feel like what, what the whole essence of this exercise is, is government asking business, what's the secret sauce or what's the secret recipe of project management in your organizations? How do you get big things done? And there's actually, in business, there's actually an art to project management. And, and it doesn't matter, I actually think that, that whether it is a, a, a smaller, chunked down tactical thing that has to get done or something big and longitudinal that you could argue is four or five years, we, we all tend to follow some of the same things. And so there's a little bit of a semantics thing that comes out of the forced ranking of priorities. I mean, in some ways you could have an intellectual debate about does it start with a vision or does it start with a goal? Does it start with, you know, uh, you know uh, informing the management? But I, I think that what you'd hear from most of us is it's about creating a culture of high performance, a, high, a, a culture of, of causing breakthroughs. And, and when, when that's the mindset, which is in the, in the um, archetype of business versus government, it, 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 you don't think of it necessarily as happening in government. And when I hear the president speak this morning, I hear him saying he wants to create intense high performance teams that are very outcome oriented and that, that result in efficient use of resources. And so, you know, I think that as we, as we carry on this discussion, you may want to, you may want to get us to, pro, you may want to force us to pry into the secret sauce of building and running high performance teams. Because it's all of these things that we're all talking about. With, with one big elephant in the room, mm -hmm. which is this concept of reward and recognition, which is fundamentally different in government sectors than it is in private sectors. Uh, and and we, we can get a lot of people to do a lot of things around but just using reward and recognition to drive behavior, which often in today's world, right, uh, maybe I should say historically, is, is either not allowed legislatively or whatever it might be relative to government employees and, and move it. there's no real incentive. But, but uh, a, lot a, of us, a lot of us build incentives and recognition based on levels of customer satisfaction. I agree. And so I, I don't know why you can't do that in the government as well. I mean, that you can. I think you can too. You know, one of the things that you do there first is you might start using the term customer. Who are your customers internally and externally? The first day at work as a CEO, somebody came into me and said, 
uh, well, the rate payers, we've got to do this or that for the rate payers. And I said, I want to expunge that term from our, uh, from our diction. And they, they said, why? But, you know, the commission describes it as all rate payers. And I said, well, a rate payer is a prisoner of a monopoly. A customer is someone you have to go out and win every day. So, you know, when you look at the question of government, you should look at how government acts and says, do you think the, the, the behaviors of government in its totality are that we're in charge and we're going to tell you what you can and cannot do, the people? Or is it a government that serves the people and has the characteristics of it? So you might want to think about changing the term to customer because going to culture, it's a whole change in mindset. We are here to serve. Now in our company, there's some people who say, I don't deal with the external customer. And I said, yeah, but in order for the whole organization to work, you have internal customers, you need to identify them, and we're going to give you a report card on how are you doing serving them, and the company is going to have a report card with our external customers about how we're doing serving the external customers. So, you know, you might think about right at the mindset, how do you change the terminology? Do you call, you know, our people, the citizens, you call them customers. You, you, you figure it out, but there needs and, to be something that B2B, signals the many, change in mindset. Many B2B customer relationships that you would define. But Harold's point is a really interesting one, to say crack open big time the issue of variable comp mm -hmm. for performance, pay for performance. And this isn't a discussion about stock options. It isn't. It's a discussion about variable pay for performance attached to achieving big project outcomes. Paid, paid out as project teams yeah. that achieve a big result, save the government X amount of money, and, and, and self funds a bonus pool, in effect, for a result. We have clearly hit a rich vein here. If you look at the chart at the top, <laughs> you see that by a factor of twice as much, this was the number one thing. There's a lot of passion and interest around it, and I think that what you were communicating in the homework and the discussion here is that once you create that mandate for change, you direct that passion and you guide it now to your first choice set, which is what to reinvent, which processes to attack, and how to frame the end-to-end -end business process from a customer has an idea all the way to completion, and it's, in our case, crossing sectors, private sector as well as public sector. Sam, thoughts on what you do when you finally figure out this is the thing that I want to reinvent or dramatically improve well, and how you go about doing yeah, it. Yeah, and let me, let me just comment a bit on, on deciding on what that, what that thing is. And I, I, I do appreciate the comments here about you know, setting hairy, audacious goals. Um, I listen to some of the, ch you know, I think about some of the challenges you would have, whether it's culture, it's people, it's incentives. And, you know, I look, you know, those are mountains whose peaks I can't see off in the distance as I think about uh, how far you have to climb. And I guess one of the things I would say is um, it, it really does seem important to me. And, you know, Indra brought up the point about what is the main, is it streamlining government? Is it common procurement? You know, common procurement across all these agencies, I think, you know, okay, I don't know. That's not a mountain I can even see out there. And uh, so I do think it is important. And I, my view would be within agencies as opposed to across agencies to be looking at what that goal is first off. I think the other thing that we, that, that we have done, our experience uh, uh, has been positive with, as we've break and broken, the, broken the, the big goal down into pieces, and as we've thought about the phasing of that, that at every phase, there is some customer or consumer benefit, and that something they can see, something they can believe in, something that your employees um, can have passion about, so you can, you can set a goal that's three years out, or, um, and, and I don't even like those. I'm, I'm, I'm really down a path of saying, if I can't get it done in a year, I may not even want to embark on that task. And of course, there are multi-year types of projects, but, but I think you really have to set time frames, you know, design to time, design that uh, process to time. But those phases, they have to have a benefit, even in the, first, even in the very first ones. We had, um, we had set a goal of taking a lot of costs out of your customer service. And, and you know, you think taking costs out of customer service, that, that uh, probably won't result in better customer service. Um, but but we, we embarked on a goal that said we're going to either maintain or improve it. And, and we're going to do that by taking a lot of the things that the customers sometimes would wait on hold to get answers for, taking that online. It seems like a very simple thing. But we started taking a lot of the very common things, the very simple transactions, and put them online. 
and you just make your way down a path over a period of a couple of years. But each individual thing, you've got a goal, you've got a customer benefit, and, and you really have an employee base that begins to see, you know what, we're really making a difference here. And those things that are really complex, that are really hard, you may not solve that with IT. You may solve that with people, and that, that can be just fine. It's very difficult in some cases to automate the very complex. But take the simple stuff, bring it down into pieces, and get it done, and, I, and over over short short time periods. Jeff, similar uh, lessons from uh, Whirlpool. Well, actually, it's quite interesting listening to all this because uh, we, we are a older company, if you will, that has gone from industrialization to becoming a consumer company, and so we've kind of lived through almost all these phases. And you know, as I think about it, uh, you know, I think at the, unless we narrow this at the forefront, the, the first question is. Really, what are we trying to fix? And, and is it is the role of government, is it the attitude, is it the tools? Whatever it is, I think the technology portion of this is, at least in my mind and experience, it's, it, that isn't the issue. It's always enabled by technology. Technology is not the challenge or the issue, personally. Um, but, you know, from my framework and, and personal experiences, is we've lived through the big vision, the hype, we've lived through the knuckle down. Uh, and, and ultimately, it became a cultural change and from a business need. And so I think really all the, actually, I really like a lot of these comments because I think they really do all fit together. And as an organization, as I think about this over the last 15 years, we've kind of lived through all these different phases. And, and where we've emerged is really getting right back to what some of the folks were saying is virtually everything we do is customer benefit divide by cost underlined by speed. And, and, and that's what business we're in. Uh, and so as we built the tools and processes and capabilities that enable that, it's, you know, it's led to what we call an organizational excellence culture, or we're still trying to build it because you're never done. And uh, it really, so, so I kind of, in my own mind, uh, you know, there, is a, there has to be a change management mandate particularly uh, you know, in private sector, sometimes that change management is you will get, you'll get killed in the marketplace if you don't get competitive. And I, and I wonder in my own mind, how do we relate that to government? It's gonna to have to be a different motivation. I mean, I think the president standing up publicly and saying we're gonna change the way we do business in Washington, might, I mean, that's, pretty, power, that's a pretty powerful start. Um, but but it but it then gets down into I, I do think you have to win people over because people aren't trying to do the wrong thing. You have to you have to, it's the, the the what are we going to change? Where are we going to change it? And how are we going to do it? Um, there is a we all have uh, whether it's a change management process any big organizational change. There is a science of change management to really get uh, people to to not passively actively or passively resist that. But you know, at the end of the day, though, I, I do think uh, there are different activities we're talking about within government. As I think about streamlining the operations of government, mm -hmm. it's it's ripe for this kind of stuff. That's that's what we all do every day. Uh, it is process driven. It is process mapping. It's about better customer benefit at a lower cost, faster. And 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 there's a lot of great professionals in the world who do that every day. The last thing I would say is we can't. We can't. I don't think an organization can let somebody else come in and do it. There has to be ownership in that department or in that part of the organization because they got to live with it, they got to own it, they got to have passion in it. Uh, I think the mechanics of how process management enabled by technology is frankly, I won't say it's easy, but it's quite well known. I think it's the what are we going to change, it's the change management that's going to involve in the organization. How do we apply these well-proven tools in the private sector and do it in a government environment which has different human resource incentives than the private sector has? I mean, that's kind of how I, and that's why I think all these comments were, because I, I kind of lived every one of these comments, mm -hmm. and we kind of had to merge to how do we make this part of what we do every day. How do you make the choice? There you are, you're sitting at the, uh, the, you know, the big desk, right, with the blotter and the big PC. Okay, you're basically saying, create that culture, the powerful vision. Now you've got to choose. 
And many of you in your written responses said, choose wisely and focus your fire, right? Words to that effect. How do you make that choice? Or how did you in your specific companies, whether it's a cargo or Greg? In our, our case, we tried to envision what it would be like if we didn't. And, and so the, ur the urgency was created <clears throat> an organization that doubles in size about every seven or eight years, and the thought of making twice as much as, of what we had really catalyzed everyone's attention. And so without duplicating what a lot of people said, the big learning that we have had is inevitably two big judgments. How valuable are common processes and how valuable is horizontal information? Because the wider the top of the T, the more expensive the project will be and the more uh, expensive the keeping of the data will be. So it better be horizontally valuable. And the, the second thing that we ran into is oxes will be gored will be broken and we categorize them the wonderful word of decision rights and I think leading large-scale transformation inevitably will change the decision rights of important legacy employees and I think how you go about that in the government I, I, I love your analogy I can't see that mountain it's, it's, <laughs> too, it's too far out but I, I think it has to be thought about whose, whose fiefdoms will come under and how do we enlist those people the last one that we felt were very dispersed business geographically. The vision's got to be there. What's the outcome we envision? But then I think in the end we consider ourselves a faith-based organization and everybody in Cargill somehow or other is from Missouri. Yeah. 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 The show, show me, me has to show yeah. up and yeah. goes to the one the one year time frame. Uh, Sam, I know that you've got to face some uh, similar uh, situations at but, uh, how did you make that choice uh, go from motivation to actually applying it forcefully in a particular area and getting results? Yeah. And I'll uh, say real quick that I'm really in alignment with Sam when I think about the, the government, not because his name's Sam also. But, <laughs> but we've actually done it uh, both ways that a lot of other people have talked about. I've lived in the company when we completely transformed it because we had to. We almost went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about, okay, people thinking about you know what happens to me after I'm done that because they know there's an incentive here if we don't keep the company alive and if you have that type then I think a big picture case for action becomes easier to rally everybody we likewise completely transform the company the last 10 years and how we go to to the market how we manufacture in a time period when we were doing really well and then we had to spend a lot of time on to interest point to the vision and we had to spend a lot of time aligning our entire compensation system with we're going to incent you for this type of behavior, to your point, and we're not going to uh, incent you if you do it the old way where you just built the wagon. That's why I'm with Sam. I can't envision that type of an approach in, um, in government. But what we also are doing is we've spent a, a quite a bit of time now, after having gone through that, putting in a, uh, what Jeff's talking about, kind of a robust set of, of tools go in and re-engineer any process anywhere in the world. It works China, India, U.S., any, any place. There are common techniques that you end up using. And to your prioritization, you, we let every area go out and do their own thing, and they have their normal budgets. But if, if, if it's a great project, the way we prioritize is we make you re-engineer first, and then we say, what's the best return on investment? And if it's a great return on investment, then we're able to fund it. If it's not a great return on investment, we don't fund it. And it, it, you're amazed, you don't think that's transformational, but over a period of four or five years, you're, you're just amazed at, at uh, how much you, you can change the company um, without doing a, a major vision. And, now, and I think for here, everybody's got to decide in government, you know, what we have to do something totally, totally different, in which case we've got to try and create that case for action. Or is it more about going out there and sending people to become more efficient, figure out how to take 132 handoffs down to one handoff, uh, those bodacious goals, and then putting that in place? Deere and company had that moment. My old company, IBM, did mm -hmm. too, and a while does it catalyze a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But for a moment, let me postulate a world in which it's highly unlikely that that government agency will go away. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is get the, the two Sams to talk just about that moment where you don't have the life-preserving moment, my gosh, I could lose my job or this entity. 
And now, how do you create that accountability, that third thing on the list, the actual engagement and accountability of line managers to be able to do the things that you've now inspired them to do, chosen to do, and now you've got to make that next step to engage them to make that happen. Uh, I would like to have a conversation turn to that sort of third element that you identified as Could critical I put a caveat to do. on that? Please. It, it comes out of so that without not only uh, the lack of the shadows of the gallows of your company, but the lack of the pay structure, the lack yeah. of the hiring and firing flexibility, we are extraordinarily constrained in uh, doing the part that Scott has said. We have to think about it's a good ways. Point. People are motivated in different ways, so I'm not saying it's impossible, but, but think of how our straightened circumstances make us think about that. So I have a, a, a suggestion there, and that is, if you look at the vast majority of people that go to work for government, they want to make a difference. They want to change. And I think the dialogue that will catalyze people is you get people in a room and say, how many of you are frustrated that we're not more effective in government? And everybody raise their hand. And then say, how many of you people are really frustrated? I mean, you question why you even work for government again. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going to raise their hand and say, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, would any of you disagree? And then say, OK. If you're so frustrated and you want to make a difference and we want to make a difference, let's use that as our burning platform. We want to make a difference. Let's work together to make it. And I think that'll be a stronger incentive than pay. I mean, I've recently worked with some um, you know, recruiters and people that evaluate managers and all. And you know, pay isn't irrelevant. And pay is very important. And we have it. But for most people, that isn't the number one motivator for why they go to work. Especially they can get paid very well and have a very bad experience. They're going to quit uh, sooner or later, and they're going to be very unhappy. But there are a lot of people that get paid a very small amount and love coming to work and think that what they do is very important, and they're energized. And so find that catalyst. But I would speculate for, for the people in government, it's like, you know, we're all frustrated because we're not getting anything done, and we want to, and let's all work together about how we can make a real difference in government and change it dramatically. Scott, I'd, you know, to that, I have a comment there to that end. You know, I, I believe that you know, most people don't purposely do something bad, slow, or costly. And, uh, and I think that the private sector or government sector, that's probably still true. And, you know, that one of the things that as I thought about this as well is, you know, when, when we talk about the businesses and why we do things, I mean, it's, it's competition, it's performance, it's result, uh, but it's also based on metrics a lot. And the well, good thing about metrics, if I benchmark metrics and somebody's better, you know, most companies have competitive spirit and you're always trying to figure out how do I become better? And it made me think about what metrics or how do you, and maybe you have them, how do you develop your, the right metrics within your department or your uh, division or your department and so on? Because I think if people knew there was a better way to do something, just the natural positive part of people is uh, they would want to do it. But you only know what you know. And if you don't know any better, then it makes the, the task even more difficult. I think our question back is, is about your metrics, actually. What, what do you look at as a chief executive? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, again, I would go back to, I mean, there's a, we have a, what we call a balance scorecard, a dashboard or so on, financial metrics, customer metrics, uh, operational metrics, and people metrics. And, and, and we don't, you know, financial metrics have already, always been hard metrics, okay? And in all, in all these other areas, you know, 20 years ago, at least in our company, those were all soft, you know, customer metrics were soft and people metrics were soft and so on. We've, through process management, through learning, through working with other companies, through benchmark, we have hard metrics for everything we do. And if, it's a, and if we don't, then it probably is, doesn't get done. And so, uh, <clears throat> at least in our type of business, having you know, the right, having data and good metrics which lead to the outcomes that you want Right. is critical to running our business. So, and the better we get at it, the, the faster we move and the more progress we make. This is actually a very helpful discussion. Is we're focusing on accountability and engagement and kind of the metrics, 
I, I'd urge you to help us in a slightly different way. Peter, you mentioned, think about processes as production lines, and it's a really good point. In transportation, that's fairly easy. We do, we have actual products. We deliver them with state and local partners. You measure them. That's fairly simple. The issue is a little bit different. Uh, if we if we focus on the output and 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 the metrics associated with that, we're missing the larger point, which is transportation is a means to an end. Um, it's supposed to be an enabler for larger goals, which we haven't really reexamined. So, in the context of climate change, uh, for the kind of economy we want to build in the future, if we just focus on that, we will be better at doing the wrong thing. And so it, it is really taking a step back and, and thinking about what exactly, and agreeing and getting that engagement on what exactly we need to do to, uh, to actually be that kind of enabler for the, the goals that we have as a country. So for example, in transportation, you might say uh, right now trans transportation is 33 or 34 percent of all of the CO2 emissions in the United States and they are at certain levels, right. so we're going to institute policies and approaches that will bring that down, and that'll be the scorecard. It's an external scorecard. So for example, it might be, what do we do to promote the electric car, which is the single most important factor in potentially driving down CO2 emissions? In, in, but those steps, and, and another one would be for us, that, that's exactly where we're headed, but goods movement. If we do the same uh, work for movement of goods that we've done in the past, we're certain it won't serve the economy of the future. So we know we need to change that. And there's, there's a, uh, a pretty big process of making sure that our employees understand that and buy into it before we go too far in, in changing your production line to produce the wrong product. Exactly. But a big, a big part of this is there's a culture and theme in this room of what gets measured gets done. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so one of the big things is, you know, in the example of veteran affairs or in the example that the president gave on the patent office, you know, the, 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 if the inefficiency isn't captured and measured and staring you in the face, it isn't going to be tackled as a project in the first place. And so a big part of, of course, what you're saying is right. You've got to focus on the right problem. You have to solve the right problem. But maybe a precursor to a lot of this is identify if, if the government takes on a culture of streamlining and attacking inefficiency and looking for resource maximization, you're going to start looking introspectively at measuring things that will, for the first time, put a line of sight on the inefficiency. Right. And out of that will come uh, you know, a revolution. Out of that will come the notion that we can't live with this. We can't live with this gets to some of your points about who do we want to be, the values of what kind of company are we. When you look at and say it takes a veteran three months to get paid for a claim, you stop and say that's not who we are. Right. That's right. not what our department is here for. Yes, what exactly. we're here to do is, you know, and you name it, and this gets back to the goal setting and then turning things and, into a And project. then to the earlier point where this is why you have to have alignment between the larger vision and the smaller goals that you're trying to achieve. Yes. because. But who cares if it's three months at this point, right? Let's, let's put that on the board and let's just all say it's three months. So how do we make it two next year? Or how do we make it one? But if you have the metrics up there and you have them visible to everyone, and your metrics have to align with what you're trying to achieve overall. I mean, it just can't be, you know, sort of made up at the end of the day. But if they, if they are aligned with what you're trying to achieve, then people can see those and they can see their sense of accomplishment and helping to achieve those. Well, but with, but without around it. around and say, what gets measured gets done. Right, right there. Without it, without it you, you're flailing at the end of the day. So these actually, go back to actually Peter's excellent uh, line about the production line. The one place we've done that this past year, precisely on this Recovery Act, $38 billion of funding. We have to get it out smart, and we have to get it out fast for it to stimulate the jobs. So we had a target to obligate at least sure. $20 billion of it by the end of the year. We got to $22 billion. We introduced through that mechanism measurements we never had inside the department. Now that we've had success in that space, we're going to take that as a best practice and try to propagate it across right. other right. some uh, others of our programs. I'm going to suggest the following at this point. We have about um, 12, 15 minutes. We're going to do a lightning round around the table. There's so much, a lot of folks have gotten a chance to talk on a word, some not as much as others. Peter, you're on. Um, just take a minute, and we'll go a minute each around the table. Anything relevant that you haven't covered? Any point that you want us particularly to particularly emphasize? Just listening to the conversation from all the departments here, it almost seems to me that 
this has got to be a make every department efficient initiative. With only one or two things that cut across all of the government. I wouldn't start with the big initiatives, streamline government objective, I'd say streamline veterans affairs, streamline energy. And in today's world in particular, and then each cabinet uh, secretary or department decide what their metrics should be and what their goals should be. And go for the low hanging fruit, which is what can be done to manual improvement, improvement of manual processes without automation. Get that done first, map the ideal processes, then think about automation. I think you're quite a ways away from taking on an ambitious IT project. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess the, uh, I, I see this, the, the reason why we have any sessions today, I think. I think there's a, there, at least from my uh, judgment, there seems to be a sense that there are things that we do every day um, in terms of how to move the ball down the field, if you will, that government perhaps doesn't. Um, and, and not, so, so in some respects, they, they seem uh, um, almost simplistic, perhaps overly simplistic. But, but at the end of the day, I, I do think that the definition of exactly what we want to achieve um, has to be there. Um, and, and it has to be something that mm -hmm. is, is lofty yet achievable. And then we, and we do have to measure um, and then align incentives around how we get, get it done. Thank you, Michael. Well, I think just as important as it is in defining the, the change that, that we're looking for, I haven't heard anything about developing a feedback mechanism that's good and sound where you understand you hit the mark. Uh, and to me, if that's not done, I think, Bill, to your point, you can go down processing something and it may be the wrong thing at the end, by the time it gets at the end of the line. So uh, i just like to, to advocate putting in as much emphasis on, uh, on some, I don't know if it's broad, individual, department, however it may work, but there's got to be a way to get feedback from the customer. You know, there are a series of cultural challenges that we face in the government. Um, I mean, Scott has talked about the 535 board of directors. Dan has talked about, um, you know, pay for performance. I mean, we not only have 535 board of directors, but they want accountability every two years. Whereas we have a president who's looking at a four-year, eight-year time frame. It's, mm -hmm. There's not an analogous situation to a company where you also agree on a five-year mm -hmm. plan, ten-year plan. We have people in Congress that demand accountability every two years, and that's part of the problem. I mean, the second part of the problem is that we you know, and we've talked a lot about customer satisfaction. We essentially have 15 executive departments that are monopolies. Um, you know, if, if you're not happy with Social Security and your check, you, you don't have an option. You just deal with that. Um, and that's part of the difficulty of shifting culture. Um, we can make those top-down demands, but it's, it's hard to internalize that where, you know, whether it's VA, Social Security. Um, you know, the other, I, I think, cultural challenge that we face as well, and, and this, it's the, you know, idiosyncrasies of how government budgets are done. You know, we tell employees all the time, you need to be more efficient, you need to save money. The result of them saving money is that next year their appropriations go down, mm -hmm. and they have less money to spend. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no, we don't incent people to make their operations run more efficient. And so mm -hmm. I know, obviously, this is the beginning of a lot more conversation will be happening, but those are just a couple thoughts that um, people might want to think about going forward. Uh, very much I would echo what Indra said, uh, I, but I would really focus on those projects. I, I, I don't know if you can do this. I was thinking about uh, the, that whole issue, you know. We have a lot of staff areas where everybody wants to spend, you know, at the end of the year they're saying, got to spend it all, otherwise my, i got to justify from where I came in instead of what the, the budget was at. And I think you got to get a create you got to create an incentive to get away from that That's dysfunctional right. behavior. And so I don't know to what degree you can do it, but you say you know for if you save a million dollars, we're going to start you at the no, the new lower level, but we're going to give you five hundred thousand for your apartment to go ahead and put on whatever new initiative you want. And the other five hundred thousand goes back to the the general coffer. Some type of incentive like that that has every organization not completely penalized for becoming more efficient. And because I'm sure there's all kinds of things that are unfunded that every department would like to go on. And if you can do more, and if you had a $10 million budget, and next year you had a $9.5 million budget, and you're doing more, that's what this is all about. And uh, uh, I mean, we've been able to do it in the shop floor, rewarding workers that way, everything. I, I, yeah. There's got to, if you can't do that, I think you're gonna have a very difficult time. You get people working on helping customers as long as it doesn't change revenue. But, uh, 
uh, <coughs> Scott just listened to all this and maybe in my own mind summarize it as to the original uh, assignment, if you will. You know, to me, this is very much more a, and it's interesting, the difference is a, how do we manage the government business structure issue as opposed to technology and processes? Because, and the reason I say that is, uh, I think from the business community, uh, very rapidly and quickly, we could share with you, and, and there are people who do this for a living every day, very well, by the way, uh, how to do the process work, how to do the metric work, how to do the technology IT work. I mean, that's readily available and we all use it. I, I guess what I'm struggling with a little bit and I think about it is it, it, you, have, you have an enterprise management challenge. And what you're saying is you want to change the outcome of a, of a, of a culture that is not current with the times and that that culture needs to be somewhat like a business in that they're fast, efficient, delivering customer service, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got big constraints uh, due to the nature of the, of the government in order to do it. So we can't replicate a private sector organization. And we got to, and to me it's then, okay, how do you, how do you define our own fast, efficient government that, that works where systems are aligned to drive the outcomes that you want. And, and so having said all that is, I, I guess my summary is, it's really important we define what problem we want to solve. Yeah. Thank you. I had hoped that Jeff would have spoken until the time was all used. <laughs> I, I think to begin, you just have to, you have to start. And, and the cultural challenges you have it is a big one, but I, I do think there is a lot of altruism that can be harnessed. And I think it has to be done in small pockets, and people need to belong to tribes of a size they can really have membership in. I, I, I do believe that saying that we're going to begin with the presumption that the culture can't be changed because the incentives can't be changed would, would be fatalistic, yeah. and I don't think it's necessary. I have the opportunity to work in a regulatory and the regulated environment with a lot of professionals. I am amazed by the skills of those people. So begin and I think balanced scorecards are a great way. Let them name their own metrics and then start walking against them. Thank you. You invited us to comment on things we had addressed. Uh, I think there's a tremendous coherence between uh, the CEOs and the government people here. We each of us have large enterprises, large organizations, <coughs> ambitious objectives, and a lot of specific ideas in terms of the vision, the production line, uh, I think resonates a lot. Uh, I think Peter was onto an important thing in terms of the motivation of the people. Any of this and all of it will only succeed to the extent that we get our whole workforce around this set of goals. I never used to understand why the HR guys were so important in companies, and now I do. <laughs> So to the extent that you want our federal employees to be able to bring us into this end state, I want to make sure that they are for the right reasons. They, they, they want to serve the public, they want to do good for the country. We owe it to them, I think, to make sure that there are career paths that would permit that. We should let them cross the stovepipes and experience what some of the other agencies do and experience. We should make sure that they've got training to keep them refreshed and renewed as our vision evolves, so may their capabilities. And I think that's going to be critical to our success as much as many of these other things. Take their place. Thank you. Bill. Yeah. Um, building on what Greg said, uh, you know, I, I think an enormous amount could be accomplished in a tiny amount of time mm -hmm. by everyone that is leading a group to just say, do more with less, much faster is our mantra. And uh, as a company that has gone through, stop and think about it, we're a fashion retailer in the last 15 months. Can you imagine what that <laughs> world's like? We've had to reinvent our company to not go bankrupt. And we are past that, and we've come out on the other side. And I have to say, it's because we got all of our associates actively involved in how are, what are we going to do, and how are we going to do it. And they, they themselves have come up under the mantra of do more with less, much faster, some phenomenal initiatives. And I believe that great leaders create cri crisis mentality 
if there's a crisis or if there's not a crisis. I, I, if I were running Veterans Affairs, I would say if it takes three months to pay somebody, it's a crisis. And it may look different than the potential of bankruptcy or you know losing your bank lines or those kinds of things, but it's up to us as leaders to create that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Do more with less, much faster. Uh, Bill, you were right. What gets measured does get done. And at the same time, radically realigning those measures uh, to, uh, for what's needed for the future uh, is the immediate task. And uh, um, it, it's, it's something we're in the middle of right now. Uh, I point out that Dan made the same point, I think. Uh, the motivating thing for our people working with the recovery projects, the stimulus projects, was we had to do it. We had to do it right away. We couldn't fail. It was a, it was a sense of national mission around it. And they got to do a lot of things very differently than where they did it before. To some extent, that's the model for it. Uh, just two things. Um, one, back to the accountability point. Uh, you know, I think as I, as I look at the backgrounds and capabilities of the, of the system, uh, or the deputy secretaries, um, there's a lot of business experience. These aren't new, these aren't new concepts, I think, to many of you. Um, so I come back to the accountability point, and I think, you know, it is, it is as simple as setting objectives and metrics and, and, and paying attention to those things. Uh, but beyond that, it becomes really important that you have the right people. And, you know, to your point about human resources, I think uh, it's going to be important that people that work for you and the people that work for them are very strong, very strong leaders, and you've got to get the right people in place to make, make, this, make this type of change work. The second thing, and it's, it's really complimentary of what Bill is saying, there is nothing like a crisis to drive innovation. Nothing like a crisis. And I, you know, I, I take your point about the appropriations issue. You, you, you save money and you won't get it back in the following year. That is not, that is not unique to government. That is, that is a, common, <laughs> a common business practice. And, and I think uh, you know, setting budget constraints is a fantastic way to drive innovation. You know, we had a project with you know, 50 people on it. It was going nowhere. We cut it to 10 and said, goal's the same. So let's get it done. And they were able to find different ways to get to the, get to the goal line. Uh, crisis or constraint is a very strong way to drive, drive to a, a different end state. I had four quick points. I'll be quick. Um, and I, just to repeat you know, some of the things that have been said uh, earlier, I think technology is, is not the answer. I think it's only part of the answer. And this process change thing is really important. I think we've saved a lot more money on process change over the last five years than we have on IT projects. And, and I think it's part of that, you know, having a, a stop doing list is really important as you kind of work through these things because there's a tendency to kind of keep doing what you're doing and then to adding on. Um, the, the second point, and I, I think this is particularly true of the, of the government, is that I think the government has a tendency to select vendors based on the lowest uh, cost to the government. And when you look at you know, all the other pieces, whether it's the service capability or the ability to scale or the ability to you know, protect you in a, in a, a, a downside situation or, or service or upgrade capability, all those things are really important. And giving the, the award for the lowest bidder you know, might cost you more down the road. Best value. Yeah, I think it is. It's really kind of the total, total cost, not just the price. Um, the third point is, I'm wondering, is the government setting their sights high enough? I mean, we've got targets to you know, reduce, uh, I think, expenses 3.5% this year, 3.5% next year. You know, given the crisis that you know, most of us have lived through in the last two years, 7% you know, over two years sounds a little wimpy. Um, <laughs> Given that you know, how we're running our businesses, and I, I just I just throw that up for uh, uh, for consideration. <laughs> and uh, and I guess the last point is that uh, you should you should use us to help because I think you know we can help not just four hours uh, in January, but I think you know this group. I mean, there's a lot of people who are willing to help work through these changes and, and share best practices and do what they need to do. Thank you so much. Believe me, we'll be following up on that idea. A few quick points. Uh, the first, it was great to see President Obama here. This is the greatest challenge people are probably undertaking in government in terms of organizing things. The president will have to be intricately involved all along. The secretaries of each department, not you all, the secretaries will need to drive this by each department because you're not number one. It's driven by the people that are number one. Uh, the the uh, second thing is, in terms of culture, 
One of the big differences in culture, I mean, that's fundamental, is in business, time is money. In government, you don't get that feeling that time is money. And what you certainly don't get a feeling of is the customer's time has no value whatsoever. It's squandered recklessly. Uh, so for example, veterans receiving their checks, social security recipients receiving their checks, uh, Department of Motor Vehicle customers, you know. They, uh, so time is really important. That has to be introduced into the, uh, the culture immediately. Uh, the other thing is don't let a technology solution drive uh, what you're trying to do. We have lost unspeakable amounts of money by pursuing technology solutions. <laughs> Fix the processes and then address the technology or even eliminate processes rather than put the technology in there. The last thing is outside of everybody's office, put a report card for the, you know, each little unit, there's a report card, it's published and everybody looks at it. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, people don't like to fail. People don't like to do mediocre performance. So maybe you can't put in place incentive compensation, maybe you can, but you can put a report card mm -hmm. outside of everybody's office about how am I doing and let the world look at it. And believe me, that will have an impact. One piece that came out of homework that I didn't hear service today, which was interesting to me was put your best people on the change yeah. effort and that might require yeah. moving them 100% off the line, which oh, yeah. felt right. pretty like a hard decision, but, but it was something that came up several times and I thought was an, was an interesting point. Yeah. The other thing on that would be don't, to the extent that it's possible, and it frequently is not, don't isolate the change effort. Have it right there happening alongside so it's not something that people cooked up, you know, way off there, but have people see it and have input into it each and every day. That way there'll be much more ownership. Let me finish up with a quick story. I, I no secret, I think I work for one of the best uh, leaders in the country, um, former general and current secretary, uh, Rick Shinseki, over at VA. Two quick examples. Uh, when he was in the Army, he was confronted with a number of these sort of reinvention challenges. And to pick one, he was confronted with a problem of needing two master mechanics, eight hours, to change the engine on a Humvee. Folks brought the, the, the problem to him. Those of you in the transportation business can imagine, you know, this is a classic example, an opportunity for business process redesign. Brought a bunch of people in the room in 90 days. The results of their work fit on the following video. Blank screen, picture comes up. There's a master mechanic standing in front of a Humvee and a woman who introduced herself as a kindergarten school teacher with no mechanical experience whatsoever. The shot clock starts. And two minutes and 30 seconds later, they successfully changed the engine. <laughs> you would not be surprised to discover that my boss has challenged us to figure out how to do yeah. a claim at the Veterans Administration in two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is exactly, this is exactly uh, what we have been looking for and hoping for. Uh, Jeff Science is going to tell you more uh, about um, our uh, work to, to uh, take up uh, that very kind offer, Ron. Uh, for you to stay engaged and be part of this community of interest and for us to get more of your help. Um, uh, Jeff, we're going to stay and do a few minutes to try to summarize the very risk set. Uh, it's been a minute or two okay, to great. at the moment. Take a break and we'll have somebody leave you back, uh, lead you back to the uh, common area. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Great yeah.